Marinero, the sick podcast. And uh, it's always cool when I touch base with former National Hockey League player. Today, he's known as the MNA of Marquette, Lachine Dorval. Enrico Ciccone, who his friends know him as Chico. I hope I'm considered a friend. Can I call you Chico? <laughs> you can call me Chico. And if I'm here tonight with you on a Thursday night, you're my friend. Merci beaucoup, Chico. I appreciate it. Look, uh, I, I brought up this conversation as a matter of fact, with, uh, of course, renowned hockey agent Pat Brisson, who also joined me on uh, the SICK podcast. And uh, there's a huge controversy right now in Quebec. He's probably a little bit more removed in it from it, of course, because he's in Los Angeles. But you're here in La Belle Province. The mayor weighed in. Even the premier of Quebec weighed in, Francois Legault, who said, Jeff Molson and Marc Bergevin, doivent être sensibles que les Québécois aiment ça avoir des Québécois. Si c'était pas bon, je dirais je comprends, mais il y en a qui sont très bons. Obviously, talking about the fact that uh, last week in a game, for the first time in the 112-year history of the Montreal Canadiens, a team, Enrico Ciccone, that you once upon a time played for, there were no Quebec-born players in the lineup. I'd love to have your thoughts today. Well, you know what? Uh, when I saw that, Tony... Let me tell you, I was, uh, I was very disappointed. Uh, I'm sure that uh, all-time greats like uh, Rocket Richard must have flipped in his grave when uh, I saw that. But the thing is, you know, uh, we can say whatever we want. You know, we can be appalled about what we saw on the ice with no uh, kids from Quebec being on the ice with the Montreal Canadiens. But what we saw on that Wednesday night, that's a result of something that went wrong from many, many, many years and uh, we've talked about it. We have raised a flag about it, about hockey and de development here in Quebec. I know that uh, Hockey Quebec is not, his mandate is not to uh, to uh, form players for, for, for the NHL. But on the other hand, if you have good development here, if you have good surrounding for our kids, how they can develop, not as hockey players, but as athletes, you know, we will make more hockey players. And now the, 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 thing that, the things that we do now here in Quebec, you know, it's been here for 15, even 20 years now, the way we develop kids, the way we try to make us, uh, try to specialize the game of hockey with these kids at the very young age, well, we have the result that we have today, Tony. I love what you're saying, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. Of course, it's the SICK podcast. I'm Tony Marinero. He is Enrico Ciccone, uh, of course, a deputy of MNA with... Uh, Marquette Lachine Dorval. The show is brought to you by Essentia, the world's only natural memory foam mattress. Go to myessentia.com slash sickpod and see why Essentia is the mattress of choice for many athletes, including over 25% of professional hockey players. Use code sickpod for a free pillow with your purchase. Essentia Beyond Organic Sleep. I love what you're selling, Enrico, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, it, once again, it's been a huge stir here in the province of Quebec over the last uh, 72 hours or so. The thing that I say, though, is I understand the importance of having Quebec-born players on the Montreal Canadiens. After all, once upon a time, it was the flying Frenchman, right? C'est la Canadienne Montréal, uh, very deep-rooted in our culture. This is who we are. This is what we do. Having said that, there's a bigger problem. And the bigger problem, which you just talked about at the root of the problem, is today there are 60 Quebec-born players in the National Hockey League playing in 2021. And by the way, going back over the past couple of years, there were even less and less than that in the last five, six, seven, eight years. So today there's 60. There's 31 teams. There's soon going to be 32. The Canadians have two of them on a full-time basis. Philippe Dano. And Jonathan Drouin. It seems to me that asking the Canadians to have six or seven or eight when they're 60 isn't realistic either, is it? Well, you know, if you look at the if you look at the numbers, you know, we talked about 50, between 50 and 60. But let, let's get it real here. We don't have 50 or 60 Quebec players playing a regular basis in the NHL. You know, uh, everybody was counted, even if you played one game or two games in the NHL. Uh, and you come from Quebec, you were in that number. So it's been like that uh, for, a, for a long time now. But, you know, let's get this really, really strong, uh, straight here, is that hockey in the NHL is not a sport anymore. It's a business. It's a business. And 
uh, we, uh, the owners, they have to make money. So when they evaluate a player, they will always evaluate none, you know, whatever you come from. They will evaluate, is this player can make my team? And is this player strong enough? Does he have enough character? Is he strong enough between the, uh, the, uh, the ears? Because you have to remember something here in Montreal is when we evaluate a player, it's not only in his skills. We have to evaluate also with psychologists because they have, they have tests they have to pass. Are they strong enough to play in Montreal? Are they able to play in Montreal? And what makes it more difficult also with uh, somebody who comes from Quebec is that you have more and more pressure. You know, uh, we all, I felt it when I played in Montreal. Uh, we, we see what's going on with Jonathan Dwayne now. Uh, we saw what happened with Dejarnay in the past. You know, so it's, it's tougher and tougher when we don't draft them to get them to come to Montreal. It's getting tougher and tougher. So, so basically, you know, uh, Jeff Molson has a responsibility, a moral responsibility to, of course, bring Quebec players here in Montreal. But the pool of player that we have, you know, it's not as much as a, a, a good and great. We have good players in Quebec, but uh -huh. if you compare, if you compare, Tony, I'm gonna let you speak. I'm gonna let you ask the question. No, no, go ahead. But, You're my guest. <laughs> okay. The, 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 what, what's what's incredible is that. If you look at the, at the numbers again, the statistic is that in Quebec, we have the fourth biggest association, not in Canada, in the world. In the world, we have almost 100,000 players here in Quebec. And we have countries that have less players than us, but the way they develop their players, they're more attractive to the NHL and they last longer in the NHL. So why is that? We have to ask a question, why is that? And we have to be humble enough, Tony, to, under, to ask the question and to realize that now the U.S. players, the U.S. hockey development, Finland hockey development, Swedish hockey development is better than us, which is our, and hockey is our sports. I know it's tough to take. I know we, we don't want to realize it. We don't want to say it. We don't want to use words for it, but we have to say it. When we will realize that, maybe we'll start to get things better in developing uh, to, to, to develop players here in Quebec. You know, I'm not entirely surprised to hear this, Enrico, and I'm going to tell you why. Look, I wouldn't know much about amateur hockey because I have two boys at home ages 18 and 16, and they never played hockey growing up. They do play soccer, and so I don't know if it's the same, but it almost sounds like it is, and I'll tell you what happens in soccer, and you'll tell me if it's like that in hockey. I find that in soccer... There is much more of an emphasis on playing games rather than practicing. There is much more of an emphasis on registering in tournaments than actually working on your skills and getting better. The, um, the importance that is given on winning games, finish first in your division, finishing first in your league, winning tournaments, winning gold medals, winning trophies, it's way, way too much. And what happens in soccer, in my and you played soccer growing up as well as hockey. You were a very good goalkeeper back in the day, if memory serves me well. But I'll tell you this. What happens in soccer is that uh, there's too much cutting corners. There's too much cutting corners to win games, to qualify for AAA, to go to the Nationals. Not enough emphasis on development. And you talked about Sweden and Finland, but correct me if I'm wrong. They're probably putting a lot more emphasis on carrying the puck, stick handling, making good passes, learning how to shoot, learning different techniques. Whereas I find that in Quebec, based on what I'm hearing, based on what you're probably telling me, that they're cutting these corners. Is that what you're telling me? Is it is Quebec is hockey in Quebec the same as soccer in Quebec? Well, don't, don't, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, we need the, the competitiveness. You know, I mean. Kids will be kids, the little boys, little girls. They want to win. They want to score goals. They want. But the thing is, it's always it's we 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 identify uh, a star player too rapidly here in Quebec. You know, we have the structure integrity here in Quebec. Is that yeah. we we determine very rapidly at a young age this kid we will put him in the structure, we will make an elite player out of him, which we shouldn't do that because a lot of, a lot of kids in hockey. They develop in the in the longer run. 
some kids are taller, some kids are bigger. You know, you need to develop one of the most principal thing in hockey, which is your ability to skate. That's the first thing you have to work on. If you look at Finland, if you look at uh, Swedish hockey, if you look at uh, the the uh, United States also now, uh, what they do is that in, in European hockey, they, they will not keep a statistics, how many goals you score, how many, what, what's your position. Kids don't have positions. They play everywhere. They practice everywhere. Everybody has the same, uh, has the same uh uh, work uh, uh, skills on the ice, which is a defenseman, a forward. Then, as you grow up, well, every everything falls into place naturally. Here we say, well, at 10 years old, 12 years old, oh, he's a defenseman. He's a, he is dans structure intégré. We got to make a defense matter out of him. We will play 12 months of hockey, you know, with all the other leagues they do, the AAA, whatever they do here, you know. So, after a while, after a while, for me, even if I played in the NHL, doing 12 months of hockey, I would have got sick. I would have got sick. I yeah. had to take a break. And now what they do is that they do hockey 12 months out of the year. They don't do other sports. You know, if you go, uh, let me give you an example. When you go to the United States, you play uh, football in high school, hockey in prep school. You need to choose two other sports. So you're a, so you're, you're a fan of multi-sport is what you're saying. You're, you, you have to be a fan of multi-sport. You, you have to develop an athlete before you get to be an NHL hockey player. It will work. For some kids, it will work. But if you put too much of the same sports, too much pressure on the same sports, on your skills, on this, on training, on that, a lot of kids, they just leave because they're fed up. Pressure from the coaches, pressure from the uh, so, the hockey Quebec. So, burnout, so, burnout. Pr pressure from the parents. Yeah. After a while, kids go, ah, oh, that's too much. I want to do something else. And, and, and not to mention, if I can, it, the importance of working other muscles in your body, because if you're working the same muscles all the time, you're not working on the other ones. I want to continue on this conversation. I love it. But first, for excellent photo, local family-owned store on Park Avenue in Montreal. Want to give them a shout-out centrally located, close to downtown shopping and universities, professional staff at the store and online to help you choose the gear that you really need. You know, Enrico, uh, my boys passed through the Spotted Tut program, which is a, a program that I liked very much, okay? Because it actually motivated them to do well in school because they wanted to stay in the program. So it worked out for me and the boys, no complaints whatsoever. But when they do that five times a week or in the summer they're playing soccer with their team four or five times a week, you know what? Every now and then when I see that they're tired, you want a night off, I give it to them. And not only that, when they want to do something else, they go to the park and they play basketball. When they tell me they're going to the park to go play soccer, believe it or not, I tell them, go play something else. I don't want them. I want them to stay in sports as long as they can. I don't want them to be fed up of sports, one particular sport, or burnt out like you just said. You know what, Tony? That's that's the the the, the it's a, the, the that's the essence of uh, an athlete. You know, an athlete will love sports. He just wants to move. You know, uh, kids these days. You know, uh, we're fighting today. The reality of things is that back back in our days, Tony. You know, we uh, when the parents wanted to uh, ground us, uh, they said you stay in the house. You know, now kids. You know, if you want to ground them, you said go play outside. You know, so that's a reality that we didn't have back then because we weren't we weren't uh, having sports against video games. That's another thing. You know, mm -hmm. kids are getting very, very attracted to video games. So, so sure enough, you know, this is something that plays against sports. So we need to we need to find something that gets gets kids moving. And how we do that? It's a very very young age. So you make them taste a lot of sports, a lot of sports. And if he comes a hockey player, he's a hockey player. If he comes to be a, a soccer player, he's a soccer player or a football player. But the thing to put too much, too much game of the same sport in the player, that will, that will burn him out. You know, if you, I'm going to give you another example. Yeah. Uh, if you look what we see in the United States, and me, something that really bothers me, is that the United States now is taking away our sports, our national sports. And that pisses me off, Tony, very, very much. But they understood something, you know, because 
what the way they do hockey is that even in high school and prep school, even in college, even in college hockey, they don't play 90 games a year. And when I say 90 games a year, I'm talking about kids that, you know, before they reach the, the junior, uh, major junior hockey league, because that's pretty much where we lose them. You know, we had they had a, a progr- the progression to the major triple A, but after that, they ride buses. They play 65, 68 games a year. They play about six, seven, eight games preseason, and they play the playoffs. How, how many games is that? It's 90 games. 90 games on a 16, 17, 18 year old kids. And what we see in the United States, kids that are 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, they play 35, 40, 42 games a year. 45 games, maybe maybe 50 with playoffs. And these kids are beating us now. So should we learn from them a little bit more? These yeah. kids work more in the gym. They work on other skills. They work on their body. You know, they're growing up. They're still getting to be men. So they're working, you know, on a certain level, a certain time, the right way. Here, at 16 years old, they determine you're playing the major junior hockey league. You're an elite player. You will do hockey 24 hours, 24 and 7 of hockey, 365 days a, a year. That's not normal. It's not human. Even I think a you're, I think you're raising, can do that. I think you're raising a great point because uh, basically, if you want to get big numbers coming out of it in the end, there's all the elite will come out. Yes, the elite will come out, but you will not get the numbers that will come out because a lot of them it's way too taxing on the body in life. Sometimes less is more. And so it's better to have 35, 40 quality games. Exactly. And work on your body than it is to have 90 games in your body because your body's going to break down. You're going to run out of gas. Speaking of which Montrealers, once again, you tired of going to the gas station, use fuel at service, whether you're at home work or anywhere in between, Download the Fuel It Canada app today. Fuel it, bringing gas to the 21st century. See, Enrico, if they could just come to your house and gas up the player who's out of gas, it would be so much better. So, uh, exactly. Enjoyable. So, if I understand correctly, as much as you're disappointed that the Canadians didn't have a Quebec born player in their lineup for the first time in the 120 year history, you blame less the Montreal Canadians and more on the structure and how we develop players in this province. Is that correct? You know what, Tony? I do not believe one second, one second, and I know all these guys there, Mario Lapointe, Marc Bergevin, Donald Odette, Serge Bovay, and I know them all personally. Never, 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 they will say, we're not going to take a Quebec player. We're not going to take a kid from here. No way. They would jump on him. They would jump on him. And sometimes, you know what they say? I can't believe they passed over this kid. I can't believe they passed over this kid. Yeah, but the thing is, Sony, you know what? All the other teams passed over him. All the other teams passed over him once, maybe twice. The thing I can't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't accept though, is that when you have a player, you know, and you determine because you know there's a chart, you know, there's a depth chart, yeah. And when there's a player that you know, they pretty much, oh, do we put this player there or this player there? Well, you have to, you have to. You have to put a Quebec player. That, you know, if if that comes to the 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 the, uh, the, the, the finish line, and th- these players will bring the same thing, pretty much the same thing. They will play the same role. Well, you have to li- have a little favoritism and put this Quebec player because that's your that's your duty as a as a professional hockey team. Uh, that in Quebec, you know, you have to uh, you have to uh, have kids that have an attachment to the players. Yeah, and uh, something they can they can uh, compare themselves to that speak the same language, and that's very important. And they have to be uh, you have to be very uh, uh, how do you say that uh, aware of that. Yeah, of but, course. You know, but on the other hand, on the other hand, they can be French, speak French, come Quebec, Japanese, Chinese, Russian, whatever. This is a business, and this is they have to win games, they have to make money, and the important thing is that the coach will ask himself. Who's gonna make me win tonight? Who's gonna make me win tomorrow uh, next, next yeah. year? And that's the same job as uh, Mark Bergeron has to do. You know, who's gonna make me win uh, for the next uh, few years? But let me tell you something. I know Donald Odette. 
I know he's fighting for the kids. I know he's in the arenas every every night. I know the South Ball buyers there also, and they want to they want to find the players. But we need to we need to develop more and more players to uh, to, uh, to 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 add the pool that we can take them from. Now there's not right. enough. So, there's not enough. So. You played for the Montreal Canadiens once upon a time, like we talked about. He's Enrico Ciccone. It's the Sick Podcast. You can listen to us on all social media platforms and watch us as well on Instagram, Facebook, and and YouTube. Um, dealing with the pressure of playing in Montreal, you brought up Jonathan Drouin's name before, who's out of the lineup, of course, for personal reasons, and you know he struggled over the last couple of months, was reminded very often, even by yours truly, I have to say, of not scoring enough goals, of not shooting enough, of not working hard enough. And uh, he's going through a hard time right now, uh, which obviously isn't pleasant for anyone. But so you before said there's 60 Quebec-born players in the National Hockey League. They're not all elite. There's 31 teams. And on top of that, if you play in Montreal, it comes with that added responsibility and that added pressure. If you were working for the Montreal Canadiens or you today who played for the Montreal Canadiens once upon a time could give advice, how do they handle this going forward? Because everyone wants to have Quebec-born players on the team, but you hate to see the Quebec-born players probably with too much pressure on them the way Jonathan Drouin had. He came here. They gave him a $33 million contract before he played a game with the Canadians with the expectations to produce and be the French star they haven't had in a long time, and it didn't work out. So yeah. what do you do? You know what, Tony? You know what the ironic thing is here is that when we saw that, what happened on that last uh, uh, Wednesday, no Quebec-born players in the, in the lineup, you know, it was a big thing here in the media. Everybody went nuts. You know, it was a great story. It was a big story. It was something that we didn't see in the last 100 plus years. But on the other end, when a Quebec player has a rough time, when he's going through a drought, you know, the media is the first to shoot him. He's the first to be hard on him. You know, you know what, Tony? There's players everywhere in the NHL. Everywhere in the NHL. They play a bad game. They have a bad week. They have a bad month. But they come back to the ring the next day, no pressure. No pressure because they don't point him. They don't talk about him all the time the same way that we do here with Quebec player. And because this is the very, number one very sport tough. Here, Enrico. Excuse me? You work, Enrico, you work sports radio. You know hockey is yeah. the number one sport here. We have all sports radio stations. Everywhere you go, people want to talk to you about the Montreal Canadiens. So... If hockey was the fourth sport here, it would be easier for these players who are slumping. They wouldn't hear it as much. But since it's the number one sport, it comes with the job, does it not? That's what I, I'm not. I'm not questioning that. That I, yeah. I agree with you a hundred percent. I'm yeah. talking about Quebec players, American players, European players. I mean, you'll get the credit as a European player. I mean, it's not fun to get credit. I mean, when you when you when you jump on one of the Russians or when you jump on one of the Finnish player or whatever, Kutkanemi or whatever, you know, it's tough for them, but they'll get over it. They'll go. But a Quebec player that lives here, that me, the the amount of pressure Tony I had my first game in the NHL. One day said, Enrico will fix things on the ice, will protect the player on the ice. I did that all my life, all my life. I never had that much pressure in Montreal that I had in Tampa Bay, Chicago, or Washington. I made one mistake one time in Buffalo. I took a bad penalty, you know, because Rejaul came in the, in the room. That's a little story. Rejaul came in the room and he said, Chico, you know who the tough guy is on the other side? I said, of course, it's Rob Ray. He goes, are you going to take care of him tonight? That's the first time in my career that – uh, somebody from uh, uh, the the brass challenged me that way because nobody had never told me Chico go fight. It was always the other way. That Stop was fighting. that was that was that was before the game. That was that was before the game, before the game in the morning skate. Ray morning skate. came and go. Could you know the top? Because he went and he he, he pointed everybody. It, we had we had a rough time and he pointed everybody. All right, and he came to me and I just it was like my 
It was my first game. I think it was my first or second game in Buffalo. He goes, you know the, the tough guy? I said, yeah, Rob Ray. He goes, you'll take care of him tonight? I said, of course, I'll take care of him tonight. Everybody knows here. And if he, if he goes rogue, I will take care of him tonight. That's not a question. But my GM said that to me. Imagine the amount of pressure that went up. I said, my God, I got to take care of this guy. So we go on the ice. First time I came face to face with Rob Ray, dropped my glove, start punching. The guy turtled. I got four minutes. Four minutes. They scored two goals. We lost the game. The next day in the, in the paper, Ciccone, dumb and dumber. In oh, the wow. uh, English in the English paper. And uh, one of the, uh, I think it was Mario Laclaire, he treated me like I was never been treated before. I, I tried to show my team that was there for them. I just started to play after an injury. I was starting the season for myself. I said I wanted to pass a message to tell them that they were safe with me on the ice. And that's how I was treated in the papers the next day. So how do you think, Tony, when I go back on the ice and play again, what kind of pressure do I feel? Well, it's exactly the same thing with other players that have other roles. It's always tougher on a kid. I, I'm not, I don't want to, you know, I just don't want to overprotect them, but that's a reality. And, and people have to know that because that thing doesn't go away. That player will stay here for the rest of his life. He will raise a family here. And that all it's always, always, always there. Cut King Amy after his career, he'll be gone. Weber after this his is, career, he'll be gone. This is a fantastic story, but please allow me to play devil's advocate if I can. Sure. Okay? The inverse is also true that David DeArnay was the number one centerman on the team, maybe for a longer period than he should have been that Jonathan Drouin, the Canadians went out and got him uh, and gave him the $33 million six year contract before he even played a game with the Canadians with only one productive season under his belt in Tampa, where he picked up about 53 points. The inverse is also true. Is it not that French Canadian players, Quebec born players sometimes get certain liberties or privileges that others do not. Do you see that too? Oh, oh, don't get me wrong here. I mean, Jonathan Duane wasn't doing his job. Sir. He wasn't playing up the par. Don't get me wrong. And we haven't seen from Jonathan Duane what we should have seen, what we should have seen. But on the other end, we should, it's not Jonathan Duane's fault that he got $33 million. All right? He signed his name, and right beside was a GM's name on it. So that should never, a salary should never play against a player. Never, never, never. Tony, if I, if, I, if I give you $2 million for your show and you screw up in the next year, well, am I going to get on your, 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 your butt because you make $2 million? No. no. Somebody gave it to you. Yeah. Maybe they made a bad decision. You know, maybe they made a bad decision. Me, if we talk about Jonathan Dwayne going through a tough time right now, and I don't want to get that on him too, too, too hard, but me – what I saw from Jonathan Duane, you know, in the past, what he did in Tampa Bay, I didn't agree with his, with him coming to Montreal because I knew that the way he was thinking, the way he was acting, you know, I didn't like that philosophy and that mentality. But hey, a lot of a lot of uh, like Jean Tremblay uh, yeah. uh, said, well, he shows a lot of character, you know, going back home because he's not playing, he didn't make the team. Well, for for me. Being a pro athlete, you do not act that way. But sometimes there are signs, and sometimes you just don't see them, or you don't want to look at them, and you just want to sign them, and you want to because there's a peer pressure. You want to bring somebody from Quebec here. You want to you want to give them the money and uh, to to make everybody happy. But sometimes, you know, it just gets back and bites you up the ass. I, I listen, I have to admit, I was in favor of the Montreal Canadiens acquiring Jonathan Drouin at the time. So I'm not going to sit here and, and lie to you and say I wasn't for a couple of reasons. Number one, I always loved the talent, but I had a couple of people close to him and close to the situation say to me, uh, you know what? It's uh, he's getting picked on by Cooper and it's not him. And the media has got the wrong story and he wants to go to Montreal and he's from La Belle Province and he'll thrive there and he's always done well. Under pressure, now, I wouldn't have given up Sergeyev, probably not, but I, I, at the same time, I, I understood the risk, really, because, you know, this, this market was looking for 
a French star, like you said. Go to sportbuffshop.com for all of your officially licensed sports apparel and more. Use code 615 for 15% on all of their items, and that includes uh, any hoodie of any National Hockey League team. Before you said it's not his fault he got $33 million, and you were speaking like an agent because you used to be an agent. And when you talked about <laughs> the structure and Hockey Quebec and the whole development, you knew it because you scouted a lot of games back in the day. Um, this is um, a tough situation that's going on right now, but your former agent, um, oh. partner, mentor, best friend, Gilles Lupier, uh, is suffering from cancer, has been given the worst diagnosis that you can get, and that it's terminal. I know this has crushed you. Well, um, you know, I haven't been able to uh, to, to to speak a lot about um, about Jill. You know, I, I've uh, you know a lot of media have asked me to to speak about him, and I couldn't do it because it's uh, it's, it's still tough for me to to speak about him. Uh, I spoke about uh, about Jill uh, last week, you know, because uh, uh, with G Jill, Enrico, uh, Jill, you know, this? okay, you you are cutting out. I think we hear you, hear you now. Okay, you were cutting out. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you can now. You hear me now? Yeah. Uh, you know, you have to understand that Jill is like a second father to me. You know, uh, Jill, uh, uh, I've been with Jill since fi I was 15 years old, and um, you know, every every situation in my life, you know, uh, it was always the first phone call. You know, I mean, you have you have we, we're Italians. We have a big family. I mean, yeah, we can turn to anybody we want, but. You know, that person, when you say, you know, you can take the phone and you can call and talk about anything. And uh, at any time of the any time of the day, even at night, you know, you'll pick up the phone and it will reassure you. Because us, you know, being professional hockey players, you know, we're big, tough guys, but we're, we're still sometimes uh, we're very sensitive and we're very uh, we worry a lot and we, we're not sure. We always second guessing ourselves, and and he was always the guy that that uh, gave me the right words, you know, to keep me going, to keep me going forwards, and in every aspect of my life, which is my family life, when I got married, when I got kids, uh, when I work with him, uh, when I uh, when I, I played with the Montreal Canadiens at the end, when I got out of retirement to play with the Montreal Canadiens, he used the right words. When I got into politics, you know, I. Gave him the phone call said, Jill, what do I do? I mean, they're all after me. They want me to go in there. He goes, well, Chico, you go ahead. You go there. You do something good for the kids. You know, you you work on it. And, you know, you get things going. And so he was always the, the guy that always put other people's uh, welfare before his own. And uh, he even, he even, uh, he, oh, fuck, Tony. <clears throat> it's okay. Uh, listen, I he's a second father to you. I, I think that that that's very clear. In the uh, in the you know in politics, uh, every year they, they deposit a budget, and uh, and after they deposit the budget, us as a, as a, well, our files, you know, me, I have sports leisure and healthy living. I have a fight against intimidation, and I also have transport. And we have a we have a lot of work because we we have the, the ministers in front of us that we question them about how they spend their money. So this is a lot of work, a lot a lot of work. And when he uh, because he Gilles got cancer before, and, mm -hmm. uh, and he kind of beat it. You know, he, he went through uh, treatments and everything was fine. And uh, he got the bad news, you know, well, um, not too long ago. But I was right in the middle of my credit. Uh, my, my credits it's called credits and um and i had a lot of work and we were speaking about it and stuff like that and and, and he knew and uh, everybody knew you know donato that knew all the players that he had knew his family knew all my friends knew but me i didn't i didn't know and he told the kids he told the guys he goes i forbid you i forbid you to tell enrico I forbid you because I will tell him myself when I want to tell him. And, and he thought like that because he knew that I had a rough time at work. I was doing a lot of work 
And the guy told me at five months, the doctor told me at five months to live. And I don't know about you, but me, if, I, if somebody told me I had five months to live, I would have done everything. I would try to get people. But he thought about me. He didn't want to disturb me. He, don't want, he didn't want to affect me in my job. And that's the kind of guy he was. He, he always thought about other people before he was thinking about himself. And that, that really touched me. Uh, have you had a chance? And I know, I know he knows how you feel. Have you had a chance to tell him one more time? Uh, we speak. Uh, we speak uh, pretty much every day, every second day. Uh, but you know what? Uh, he's getting tired. He's getting very, very tired. But he, he's okay with it. You know, he's he's okay with it. He's um, he accepted. He accepted it. And um, you know, and I think he's ready to go. He's ready to go. And uh, you know what? You know, hopefully, hopefully it will it will last five months. But Tony, you know, with uh, with everything that's going on and the way uh, he's uh, he's thinking about it right now, I don't think it's gonna last. Uh, it's it's not gonna last five months. That's for sure. Because you know, the, the way he sees things, he he doesn't want to suffer. And I think the doctors don't want to let him suffer. But uh, the way uh, I want to remember him is that uh, he do, he's uh, he was a great man, and he, he was somebody that always put other people's welfare before his. And uh, he would have done anything for the kids. You know, he would have done anything for the kids. And uh, this is a fight that will that will, that will, that I will keep going. And uh, in his name is that he wants to ban fighting in hockey, in junior hockey. And this is something he was working on for the last 20 years. And we worked on it together. I deposit a bill on it to uh, to um, to uh, ban fighting in the, in junior hockey. And this is this is my goal now. You know, hopefully, I would have wished that he would have seen it uh, pass uh, while he was alive. But uh, if it's not possible, well, you know, I'm sure that he will be happy when that when that go through. If that goes through. It's um, it's so beautiful the impact he had on you and uh, and he really was a second father to you. I think I, I said that before, but I think that much is clear. And what beautiful words that you had to say for uh, and and still saying for your friend Gilles Lupien. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's tough. It's uh, it's it's I can you know it's it's tough for me from the outside, and here he was for you, friend, uh, partner, mentor. Uh, agent all the courage in the world to you enrico and and th thanks for taking the time to talk to us about Gilles lupien so we have a better understanding for those who didn't know clearly we're talking about a very special person thanks for taking this time enrico well anytime tony thank you very much merci thank beaucoup you. there you have it he's enrico ciccone i'm tony marinero it's the sick podcast uh special thanks to sentia and all of our sponsors uh, of course, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Sick Podcast. All the courage to you, Enrico. Merci beaucoup.